Good morning. It is uh, great to see everybody here this morning. Should have had plenty of time with the time change this morning, so we're glad to see you all here. I'm going to invite you to stand as we open up our worship service this morning. will be the only name that matters to me the only one is favor I seek the only name that matters to me yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me the only name that matters to me Yours is the name, the name that saved me, mercy and grace, the power that forgave me, and your love is all I've ever needed. Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I seek, the only name that matters to me. Yours is the name, the name that saved me, mercy and grace, the power that forgave me, and your love is all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory and with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. When I wake up in the land of glory and with the saints I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus and just that name. Jesus, 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 just that name. When I wake up in the land of glory and with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. When I wake up in the land of glory and with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. Oh, la 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 Oh la 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 bow in a word of prayer with me this morning. Dear loving God, we thank you so much for just a time that we can gather here together, corporately worship you, lay all distractions aside, set them at your feet knowing that you're in full control of, uh, of what's going on around us and we just uh, pray that as we deal with whatever we're dealing with this past week or this coming week that you would just be at the forefront and as we, we, as we submit that into your will that uh, Everything that we would do would be honor glorifying to you. We uh, are so thankful for the young people and the chance that we get to celebrate a 
dedication this morning, and we uh, look forward to that. And as, as they gather with family and a, a time just to honor you through the gifts that you have given us. We thank you so much also for just the time that, uh, that uh, other ministries are, are moving forward and, uh, and taking place. And we just we, we thank you so much for the provisions that you've made through that. We want to commit the time and us into your service for this morning. And we pray in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to get you to turn to those who have come to worship with us this morning and give them a shout out and a fist bump, whatever you can do, respectfully. And we... Uh, Encourage you on online as well, if you're using your technology to do that, just to reach out our community, your family members, whatever. Encourage them this morning. That's what we're to do. And uh, as, we, uh, as we do that in the name of Christ this morning. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. O maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. As I am alive because I'm alive in you And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ That covers me and raises dead men's life it's all because of Jesus, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. I am alive because I'm alive in you. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ That covers me and raises dead men's life It's all because of Jesus Every sunrise sings your praise The universe cries out your praise I'm singing freedom all my days Oh, now that I'm alive It's all because of Jesus I'm alive It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raise this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ. That covers me and raise this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm going to read Psalm 37, verses 1 to 9. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. 
For like the grass, they will, with, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn away from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Oh, lifting gratitude and praises with compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven because of your love our hearts are clean we lift you up with songs of freedom forever we're changed because of your love yeah gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing lord we've come to give you thanks for all you've done because of your love we're forgiven because of your love our hearts are clean we lift you up with songs of freedom forever we're changed because of your love because of your love we're forgiven because of your love our hearts are clean we lift you up with songs of freedom forever we're changed of your love yeah East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever, his heart is my home. Everybody has trials and temptations. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Everybody knows heartbreak, isolation. Ooh. our burdens down lay our burdens down what a friend we have in jesus east to west my sins are gone i see grace on every horizon and forever and ever his heart is my own everybody has fears everybody's got worries Ooh, 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 ooh. Everybody knows sorrow, devastation. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But we can lay our burdens down. Lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
Peace to us, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever his heart is my home. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever his heart is my home. Oh, no more betrayal, for he is faithful. He fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful. How he has proven it over and over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful. He fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful. How he has proven over and over, over and over, what a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever his heart is my own. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon. And forever and ever his heart is my home. Forever and ever his heart is my home. Forever and ever his heart is my home. Good morning. You may be seated. I'll welcome you this morning to our worship service. And those of you who are in present present here, those of you who are joining us online, we're glad you can take part with us today. This morning is a special occasion for us as a church family and for one of the families in our church, for Braden and Agnes Boot. Uh, they are coming forward uh, in uh, child dedication with Marcus this morning. And I would like to invite you if you would come and join me at this time. nice, peaceful child. I have given up years ago trying to hold children during child dedications because I make them cry. I want to read a passage from Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's a powerful passage and it speaks of the passion that Jesus has for children. And I love child dedications and I've made it no secret that the favorites in my church are the kids. I mean, I love the adults in the church, I love you guys, but I really love the kids. Um, there's just something, there's just a privilege that comes with being able to share Jesus with, with kids, and, uh, and, and I never grow tired of, of the joy for that. Um, it's also special for me this morning just to share this time with you guys. I, I think when, when I first came uh, to Fort McLeod Alliance Church. The first home I was brought to was your parents' home. You guys were having youth group that night, so you, you were there for that. Um, wasn't long after that that uh, the, the new pastor got invited to Braden's uh, birthday where he got pelted with uh, paintballs, right? I can still remember the one that hit me right in the top of the head. Uh, also laughing at your mother as she was dressed up in her Kevlar paintball vest because she said it hurt too much. Um, yeah, and then to walk with the two of you through your preparations for, uh, for Christian marriage and to be part of your wedding, and, and now today as a church family for us to share in this dedication. It's, it, it's a special occasion. Um, the verses I've read speak of the high value that Jesus has for children and his protective nature over children. The children he places in our lives, he gives us a great responsibility when he entrusts them to us. 
child dedication, such as we're having here today, is a church tradition where we hold up the value of children and we seek for God's blessing on their lives, even as we recognize the responsibility that He gives us as a family and as a church family to raise Marcus in an environment where he will hear about Jesus. Well, he will hear about Jesus and have the opportunity to respond to Jesus in his life. See, my prayer for Marcus today, my prayer for him is that he would become a faithful man of God. Now, we look right now, I mean, he's so small, and to envision that in the future is such a long ways away. But that's really the essence of what happens when we come in dedication. We are dedicating ourselves to the journey of walking alongside what God will do in Marcus' life as he seeks for him to one day become a faithful man of God. It's not enough to come to a ceremony of dedication. This is the fun part. I know you're sitting here going, you made me stand in front of a bunch of people. That's not the fun part. This is the fun part. There are a lot of days that will follow that will have days of joy, days of tears, days of wondering, and days of calling upon God. What happens here, the heart of what is happening today, is really a commitment of intentionality. That throughout Marcus' lifetime, you as mom and dad, we as a church family, will intentionally show Jesus into his life. In fact, Mo and Jamie haven't stopped in their pledge of dedication of showing Jesus into your life as their, their kids. Marcus is doing nothing today other than being very cute. We are asking God's blessing on his life, but he is dedicating nothing of himself today. We trust that will come one day that he will make that dedication to Christ himself. You, Braden, and Agnes are making the dedication, really of yourselves, to the responsibility of teaching Marcus what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It is your calling to teach this diligently and intentionally to Marcus, to talk about it when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, as the Scripture says. It's not hard. or It's an intentionality, something that you will do every day. Now, remember, it is hard to lead him in a place that you're not willing to walk yourself. So, Marcus will watch you as mom and dad, how you respond to Jesus, your relationship with Jesus, and that will become his first picture of what it is to know God. And so, I encourage you, Braden and Agnes, to be strong in your faith, in your commitment to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength that you as husband and wife would together be united in Christ. And always remember, I say this at every child dedication, the most important relationship in your home is the one between the two of you. And the gift that you give Marcus is sometimes to say no to him because your marriage needs to be strong in Christ. As a church family, we also coven with you today for as long as we are part of this church body, we covenant to contribute to this dedication through our prayers, through our friendships with the two of you, with your family, and with our commitment to the children's ministry of our church. Now, Braden and Agnes, are you prepared to enter before the Lord into a pledge of dedication on behalf of Marcus Maurice Boot? Will you, Braden and Agnes, pledge in dependency upon God to make your home a place of loving God and loving one another? Will you seek to bring Marcus up in the training and instruction of the Lord, anticipating the time when he will respond to God's grace himself and become a child of God, a follower of Christ? Will you seek to demonstrate both in word and deed in your life what it is to be a follower of Jesus 
including faithfully bringing Marcus to church to participate in corporate worship and fellowship around the Word of God. If this is your desire, please respond, we will. I invite you as a congregation to join me in standing. If you're part of our congregation online, we include you in this dedication, and I invite you in your homes where you are to pause and join us together in standing. As a church family, we gather around Braden and Marcus and their family, and we share in their pledge to support their endeavors to raise Marcus to become a faithful man of God. I ask you this morning, will you, as you remain a part of Fort McLeod Alliance Church, pledge to support Braden and Agnes in leading Marcus in the ways of Christ? Will you pray for them and for the families of our church that Christ would be known in and through them? Will you support the children's and youth ministries of our church with your prayers and as God prompts you, your time, your energy, and your giving, that the church might fulfill its mandate of making disciples of Jesus, of the children and youth of our church? The gospel starts at home, with firstly leading our own in the ways of God. If this is your pledge this morning, please respond, we will. Please join with me as we pray. Lord God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for Braden and Agnes. I thank you for their faith in you. I pray that as they continue to grow in life and in faith, that they would see you strong and able and present in their lives. I pray, Lord, that during the seasons when they are faced with anxieties and worries, that they would see that you are enough that they would be able to cast their cares upon you, knowing that you care for them. Father, I pray today for Marcus. We thank you for the treasure and the blessing that he is. I pray that you would protect his life. I pray that you would guard his life. Lord, your words speak of the angels that protect the little ones. Lord, I pray that you would help bring to mind, both as a congregation and as a family, our pledge to be a part of seeing Marcus grow to become a person of faith and to trust his life to you. I pray that at a young age, Marcus would give his life to you and know the joy it is to be a child of God. We thank you for him, Lord. We pray your richest blessing upon his life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Just please be seated. That is great to see. It's uh, our young families. They're, uh, they're important to us as a church, and uh, we definitely want to support all those things. We're just going to, as we continue with that, I'm going to invite you, if you've got them, to take your bulletins. We're just going to highlight of a few things that... Uh, we feel that are important for you to know. And again, if you don't have these, if you're joining us online, these are available as well on our website. You can go and, uh, and get this information. Uh, just going to highlight a few things here with you. Um, Operation Christmas Child is coming up. We have the opportunity to give back and to all the, the young kids and the, and the uh, people who are, are, are struggling or doing with less. We want to express our love and uh, the love of Jesus Christ through these shoe boxes. So that's coming. You have three options there. You can donate, either personally build a box, you can have the youth build a box, or donate to have that done for you. And uh, they'll be brought up here, and we're going to actually make a tree up here. We do every year, and we're going to just kind of build that as we send them off with love. So you can be start preparing for that as you uh, as you uh, you know faithfully give to uh, to serve others that way. Uh, Pastor Kevin's going to be out of the office, and that's going to be from November 2nd to 9th. And uh, normally there's a, a prayer retreat and a, a time of retreat for the pastor, his wife, and uh, as they gather with others in the ministry. But uh, because of the situations right now, uh, it's still important that they get away for a retreat, and we hope that they're going to fulfill that and enjoy a time away as well as uh, it's great to to retreat and to <laughs> refresh, actually. So if you have any questions or if something comes up or matters need to be attended to, please uh, contact somebody on the board. They're listed in your bulletin or online as well. You can contact any one of us at any time, 
and we'd be more than happy to help out just to give Pastor Kevin that uh, a time of, of uh, that he needs so much. With our young people and uh, and things, the ministries that we are we feel that are a priority, not that any aren't a priority, but our young kids are, uh, like Pastor Kevin said, are just a joy. We're excited that the nursery's back up and going, so uh, there are some limitations to numbers and whatnot, so you can sign them in, we take care of it uh, that way as well. So if that uh, pertains to you or that's a service or a ministry that uh, can be utilized, please know that that's there. Also our Discovery Land, there's uh, ages of kids that are going to be three to eight. That's ministering to them as well, which is, uh, again, a fantastic avenue. We also have our family room up, uh, designated up top for families with kids and, uh, and that separation or just as an overflow as well. If that's some place that, uh, that you feel comfortable, uh, we also have that available for, for, uh, for just a, an extension of this ministry and church going on. We have Discovery Land and Junior Youth, and there's other programs that are gone. I'll leave that for your discretion here and uh, what pertains to you with youth, la ladies' Bible study, and small groups. Again, all ministries that we feel are very important to the survival and to maintain the ministry, not only just within the church, but just our mandate to actually take that out into communities. So we encourage you to get involved with that, to look at where you can be involved and to keep these ministries going and, and active in your church, your local church. Uh, I'm just going to invite you to stand. We're just going to take a quick prayer. And before we continue with mu uh, music, so I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue to worship through prayer and music this morning. Loving God, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. And as we normally take this as a time of giving for our tithes, we just pray that as people give through different means, whether it's through the back or, or online, we thank you so much for the resources you've given us and that just a small portion that we can give back to watch it grow and to, to do ministries that, that uh, are, again, beyond our power, but just what you use. We thank you so much for the people of this church, the committed people who keep these ministries going and as, as our or as Satan tries to silence, to isolate, to separate, we just don't want to give him that foothold. We want to continue in, in the power that you've given us to ministry to minister to those around us who are hurting. There are so many people hurting through, whether it's depressions or separation or financial burdens or whatever the case may be, even death at that point where we cannot comfort. We just pray that you would wrap your arms around them and, and that you would know that there, or that uh, you would just help them know that there are a group of people praying for them and to support them and that we would break through that and just be part of our community as, as you would like us to. We want to commit the rest of the service, all the aspects of the service and ministries going on again into your care and uh, we just pray this in your precious name. Amen. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped down into time, wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder So that we always remember You and I were made to worship You and I were called to love You and I are forgiven and free For you and I embrace surrender You and I choose to believe You and I will see we were meant to be all we are and all we have is all a gift from God that we receive brought to life he opened up our eyes to see the majesty and glory of the King. 
He has filled our hearts with wonder so that we always remember you and I were made to worship you and I were called to love you and I are forgiven and free you and I embrace surrender you and I choose to believe you and I will see we were meant to be even the rocks cry out, even the heavens shout, the sound of His holiness. So let everyone sing out, let every knee bow down, He is worthy of all our praise. For you and I were made to worship, you and I were called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. When you and I embrace surrender, you and I choose to believe, then you and I will see. You and I, oh, you and I were made to worship. You and I were called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. You and I embrace surrender, you and I choose to believe, and you and I will see we were meant to be. Yeah, we were meant to be. We were meant to be. We were meant to be. I'm going to read Matthew 15, verses 1 to 20. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what may have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know what the Pharisees were offended? Do you, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. 
Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story because I know it is true it satisfies my longing as nothing else can do i love to tell the story it will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of jesus and his love i love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams i love to tell the story it did so much for me and that is just the reason i tell it now to thee I love to tell the story, it will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, it is pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest and when in scenes of glory i sing the new new song it will be the old old story that i have loved so long i love to tell the story it will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story 
of Jesus and his love to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Please be seated. So, anybody else this morning left with way too much candy sitting in the bowl at home? We obviously weren't generous enough at the beginning. Now I'm stuck eating all the leftovers. Yeah, yep. Anyways, I am not claiming any sort of inspiration for uh, sermon choice this morning. Perhaps it has more to do with... uh, mischievous streak. I mean, some of the kids may go home today and and say, Jesus didn't make his disciples wash their hands um, before they ate. And, uh, you know, moms will reply and say, well, if Jesus was to go and jump off the bridge, would you jump after him too? Yes, would be the appropriate reply. I mean, it's Jesus, right? And perhaps a story about not washing your hands isn't the ideal choice between, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic and That maybe has something to do with my mischievous streak as well. I recognize that there are way too many ways for you to misuse and misrepresent this text when you go home from here today. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. The passage actually isn't about primarily hand washing. It's about something else. Your mom's been telling you to wash your hands before you sit down to eat long before the present time. Probably wise just to do what she says. Jesus asked two questions in this passage. We've been looking at questions Jesus asked. We're on our ninth installment. Um, I told you there's over 300, but we're not going um, to 300 sermons on questions. We've got probably three more. But in this ninth installment on questions that Jesus asked, Jesus asked two questions in this passage that Fran read for us. Why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? And why do you, and do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? NIV goes on to say, puts it this way, goes into the stomach and comes out the body. And if you're reading from the message translation this morning, well, it, it's not quite as delicate in its phrasing of what's going on here. If you have this picture in your life of Jesus as being oh so prim and proper, then you just, you might have a different view of Jesus by the end of today. He actually uses, um, he tells it, part of his spiritual teaching is using a parable that looks at the most basic and not socially appropriate to talk about aspects of life. Yes, Jesus uses poop to make a spiritual illustration. With that, I got every kid's attention. The Greek that our English is so delicately trying to translate is actually the word for latrine. So you translate this phrase, it goes, this, goes into the stomach and passes into the latrine. So you can take it from there. Title of the message this morning is When Washing Your Hands Makes You Unclean. When washing your hands makes you unclean. And what we want to see by the end of it, the point is not about washing your hands or the other thing that Jesus is talking about. Rather, Jesus, as we're going to unwrap this passage, is talking about the expressions of the heart. The expressions of the heart. Passage is in Matthew chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, that's where we are this morning. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. There's a parallel account in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. Mark actually gives a few different details, a lot of it because of the audience, the first readers of the different parts of the Bible. Matthew's first readers were a Jewish audience. They understood the traditions and customs that, uh, that were being expressed here. Mark was, hit the first audience to the Gospel of Mark was a Roman or Gentile audience. And so they needed a few more explanations. And so in Mark we read this, it's talking about the hand washing. It said, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. 
And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dinner couches. So those were some of the, the details that were part of that. The passage, though, begins with a question not from Jesus, but to Jesus. Question came to Jesus from the Pharisees, and it was asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat? This was a concern. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. This was a tradition that Jewish people were to follow. And they asked Jesus, and Mark says this, that it came about after, it says they saw some of the, his disciples ate with his hands, ate with hands that were defiled. That is, that they were unwashed. Now, a couple of observations for that. First off, not all the disciples were included in that criticism. The Pharisees said, and some of the disciples. Second observation, Jesus wasn't included in that criticism. Jesus likely had washed his hands and had kept with that tradition and that custom for whatever reason we may unwrap in a few moments. Because sure enough, if he hadn't, they would have been critical of him as well. But they came to Jesus and said, how come some of your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? They eat. Now, it's important for us to understand we're somewhat removed from the culture and time. This wasn't firstly about cleanliness. The idea, the ritual here of washing your hands before you eat uh, wasn't firstly about cleanliness. It was an extra biblical tradition that had been passed down among the Jewish people, but it was not a command of the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 30, the priests were given instructions regarding washing their hands before they entered the temple for the aspects of, of how they led in worship in the temple. The Pharisees wanted to bring the sacred into the everyday life. And I mean, that, that's a good thing. The Pharisees were wanting to bring the sacred into the everyday life of all the people. And so what they did is they established a tradition where they extended what the priests did as they prepared to go into the temple. They extended it into the everyday activities of, of all the Jewish people. And actually, this is, this is a ritual that is still practiced today by many Jewish people. It's a ritual where one pauses to wash hands and say a blessing before a meal. And it's meant to be a tradition where you pause and reflect on what you were about to eat. I read that, I'm not quite sure. You know, it's kind of like sometimes when we pray, Lord, make us truly grateful for what we're about to receive. And that's always a question of what is it that I'm about to receive. The issue wasn't the tradition. Jesus didn't have an issue with the tradition, per se. Traditions are not in themselves bad. We practice many traditions. How many of you regularly pray before you eat a meal? Okay, four of you. Yeah, the rest of you, you say, no, I will not raise my hands in church. Yeah, many of us pray before we eat a meal, right? Um, would it surprise you to know that's never commanded in the Scriptures? We are never given a command in the scripture that says, before you eat, you should pray and give thanks. The closest exception to that would be the Lord's Supper, where in institution, Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus gave thanks, broke bread, and said, do this in remembrance of me. We have an example. Jesus gave thanks before breaking bread in Luke chapter 24, verse 30. And Paul, after being shipwrecked, and he was on this, this place they got out of after shipwreck, it's recorded that he gave thanks before he ate. But there's no actual command. The command in Scripture actually says, give thanks always. Give thanks always. Now, how, what does that look like? What circumstance? I, you know, when I was a mechanic, I didn't sit there and, uh, you know, as I was doing an oil change, saying, Lord, thank you for this oil I'm about to receive. Didn't do that then. But usually I pause before a meal and I pray. And it is a tradition. It's a good tradition, I think. But it's still a tradition. 
Paul gives thanks before a meal. Traditions are not bad. Traditions can be powerful, stabilizing influences for people and for communities. We have traditions around Christmas. We're going to bring out an Advent wreath in the not-too-distant future and begin our Christmas tradition around the Advent wreath. Nowhere in the Scripture are we told to worship Jesus using an Advent wreath. It's a tradition that we adopt. Many of us have a star on the top of our Christmas trees. Star reminds us of the star we read in the Christmas story. Nowhere are we commanded to. It's simply a tradition. Even when we come to certain ceremonies, when it comes to weddings, when it comes to funerals, when it comes to child dedications, I will often use very similar words in those as part of a tradition that brings people a sense of stability in these moments in their lives. I'm actually not a big fan, and I mean, if you've done it, that's fine. Don't, I mean, I'm not being critical of you. I'm not a big fan of couples when they want to make their own wedding vows, right? And they always want to make these, these all whatever wedding vows are all so lovey and sappy and all whatever to each other. I, like, I, I prefer, my preference is when couples get married and they share in traditional wedding vows. Why? Because the wedding isn't just about them. It's also about the community that gathers with them. And it brings stability. It brings reminders. When I'm at a wedding and somebody says the same kind of vows that I made at my wedding, I am reminded again afresh it provides an anchor. It provides something that, that brings stability. Traditions can be good and positive things. The problem with what was going on in this passage was not the tradition. Daniel had a custom three times a day he would turn to God in prayer. An interesting thing, I'm taking a, a missions course right now, and, and they highlighted in one of, the, one of the classes that I took online with it, um, there are many Muslim people, and part of their custom is to pray to God five times a day. And many Muslim people who become Christians still continue with that tradition of praying five times a day, only now they're praying to Jesus. The tradition can have positive things in our life. The problem was not the tradition. The problem is when the use or the misuse of tradition causes us to hide our hearts from God. The problem is when the, when the tradition becomes going through the motions and it's lifeless and spiritless and the very use of the tradition keeps us from the heart of what God would want to say to us. Jesus answered the disciple, or Jesus answered the Pharisees. He answered them, Verse 3, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? He doesn't specifically answer the complaint on the hand washing. He's going to come to that a little bit later. Rather, he highlights how in this particular instance, the tradition of the elders becomes an excuse for ignoring the commandments of God. Jesus goes on, verse 4 to 6, and he gives an example. He says, you're concerned about this tradition... Not a command of Scripture, but a tradition of men that's not being upheld. Well, let me, let me point out another one to you, is what Jesus said. There was this tradition where if you looked at your parents and said, you know what, I'm basically a gift from God to you, and I'm going to commit that gift to God, that by doing that, you no longer had to give proper honor to your parents. The command of God was to honor your father and your mother. Now, what does that look like? Part of that includes, at least in the Old Testament, or at least in the, in the Bible time, and I think still applies today, part of that includes, as they aged, how you would care for your parents. Holy Spirit, through Paul, says this later to Timothy. It says, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness in their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Jesus said, you know what, this is what God says for you to do in honoring your parents, but you actually disregard that, and you use a tradition as a means to disregard it. And so he says in verse 6, just before calling them hypocrites, he says, so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void 
the Word of God. There's two things I want you to get from this. Traditions do have value until they are misused as an excuse to excuse the real issues of the heart. For instance, we may pray at a meal. Is this a meaningless ritual or truly a pause to reflect in thankfulness to God? I mean, I'll confess, there's times that I've gone and I've prayed before a meal and it's been, I'm just doing it. Tradition, but what's behind the heart of it? Do we we betray that if we pause to reflect and be thankful to God and then our meal conversation degenerates into complaints? Do we betray the heart of what God would have us do with our tradition? This morning... We have a child dedication. It's a beautiful tradition. Even as in some circles, infant baptism is a a beautiful tradition. Some circles, infant baptism carries a false theology that needs to be corrected. Uh, What happened today did not make Marcus a Christian. But sometimes that tradition can get in the way of the heart of a matter. See, sometimes parents will take their kids to a ceremony, and I've done my duty. And that's good. And the tradition replaces the actual commitment to bring Christ before the life of your kids on a day-to-day basis. Or sometimes it may be, and I know I'm going to step on a few toes this morning, so be it. I know the demographic I minister in, and, and so be it. If I'm wrong... Don't show me by your tradition, show me by the Word of God. Sometimes, sometimes we were dedicated or baptized as an infant, and we use that tradition to excuse ourselves from the commands around believer's baptism. The Bible tells us to believe and be baptized. We're told to go and make disciples, baptizing them. The command of Scripture calls us to be baptized. But there are some times that we'll sit back and say, well, I was dedicated as a child, or I was baptized as a child. My parents followed that tradition, and it was a good thing. It expressed the good heart of parents that wanted a good thing. But when we misuse a tradition, and we allow that to get in the way of obedience to the clear commands of Scripture, we do wrong. It is easy for us to use traditions to have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. No tradition, no pastor, no teacher, no Pharisee, no pope, no special literature, no sacred tradition used to explain the scriptures, no catechism. None of these things are inerrant scriptures. They may have value. And I have learned Great things from, from people and from reading and, and using catechisms. There are, good, there are good values in those things, but they are not the inerrant scriptures. And there are some times, I, I discovered it when I went to Bible school, I think I've shared it a few times. I mean, I didn't come from a religious background at all, so, so much of it was, was learning theology fresh. Um, I find that many times believers and many times churches are more interested in supporting a system of theology than they are the scriptures themselves. And so when we have a theological argument or a debate and it comes, centers around our traditions, we will uphold scriptures that we can make say what we want them to say while ignoring those that seem to get into our way. You know, if we're to be faithful to the Word of God, we need to look at the whole of Scripture and wrestle with some of those things that may not naturally fit what we want it to say. Because, you know, the goal of reading your Bible is not to make it say what you want it to say. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. The goal is just like any other form of communication. Am I understanding Am I understanding what the communicator intended to say? Am I understanding what God intended to communicate? Right, and you've, you've, used, you've used that before um, because you, some of you as husbands, some of you as wives, have simply taken the words of your spouse and said, this is what I want them to mean. And you've perfectly known that they meant something else. 
our approach to God, our approach to the Scriptures needs to be one of not, God, I'm reading your Word to support what I want it to say. Rather, we need to be open to the Word of God to say, Lord, you speak into my life. And I sometimes ask Christians, when's the last time God changed your mind? When's the last time you have studied the Scriptures and your mind has been changed? If you look back and say, I can't remember when, then is that because you bring a complete knowledge to the Scriptures and you know it all? Or is it because you put a wall up to hear anything from God that doesn't fit where you want it to naturally be? What would God say of some of our traditions? Some of us, some of you grew up with traditions like we wear our best to church, but at the same time do so little to clothe the poor. Or perhaps we give to missions at a missions conference as a tradition, and it excuses us from actually ourselves being on mission. Or like Cain, we bring an offering before God. We do something religious before God. Maybe it's even a religious tradition. And use that to hide the fact that God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. This was Jesus' response to the question of hand washing. The tradition was not wrong in itself. But the Pharisees who had down pat all the traditions used tradition to excuse hearts that were in one manner or another disregarding the Word of God. I don't want you to misread me here. I, I, I believe in tradition. Traditions can aid our worship of God. They can be very valuable in the community of the church and the family. But let me ask you, what traditions might you hold to that actually hide you from God? Are there traditions that you would hold to that hide you from responding to the voice of God in your life? Okay, we're going to carry on to going down to verse 10 here. We're going to get towards the poop question here. Down in verse 10, Jesus stops talking to the Pharisees, and he looks at the rest of the people. He, he says, and he called the people to him and said to them. He shifts from the Pharisees. The disciples, actually, one of them comes to Jesus and says, do you know the Pharisees were offended by what you said? And Jesus' response was, let the blind lead the blind. I hope Jesus never has cause to say that to me, that my, my mind and my head is so stubborn that I won't listen to God, that he says, you know what? Whatever, let the blind lead the blind. Jesus turns from the Pharisees and he talks to the people. And he begins to talk to them about this issue, this question that came from the hand washing. The question that came from the whole incident with the hand washing was this What defiles, what pollutes, what makes my life unclean? That's why they practice a ceremonial hand washing washing, because they may have touched something, they may have been exposed to something that made them unclean, and the ritual was to make them clean. So as Jesus is talking to the people, he's dealing with them with the question of, what is it that defiles, what is it that pollutes, what is it that makes my life unclean? For us today, it would center around a scary word that we call holiness. The Bible calls us to holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We as Christians struggle with this. We say, we know we're to be holy, but what does holiness look like? What does holiness look like? Is it about what I touch, or what I'm exposed to, or what is it about? What did I touch? What was I exposed to that leaves me unclean before God? And so Jesus shifts his conversation from the Pharisees to the people and say, I want, us to, I want you to understand what this is really about. Because it's a question that came up that related to the hand washing. And Jesus, as he's talking to the people, is actually correcting one of the teachings of the Pharisees. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying this, being exposed to sin does not make you unclean. It's not what you touch. It's not what you're exposed to that makes you unclean. He says, the sin issue of sin in my life, the issue of what separates me from God is not an external issue out there. It's not about what I'm exposed to, what I touch, or what I've eaten. All those things from the outside. 
Holiness is not about the language I hear in my home or the alcoholism I grew up with. It's not about abuses that were done to me that leave me feeling like I'm unclean. It's not about what I've been exposed to. It's not even about what's on my TV set or the stories or behaviors that I'm subject to in the coffee room at work. The Bible says this. Holy Spirit is talking through the Apostle Paul. He's actually talking about church discipline and about how, ch- how we handle when Christians are adamant about remaining in their sin. And G- Paul gives them some instructions on that. Then he says this, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. You live in this world, you're going to be exposed to sin. Jesus, God in flesh, without sin, entered a world where he was exposed to our sin. And so Jesus says to the people, he says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Now, Peter doesn't get it, verse 15. Peter doesn't get it. He says, explain the parable to me. And so Jesus has another question here. He says, are you still without understanding? And the, the, the ESV is such a polite translation. NIV says, are you still so dull? The message, it just puts it this way, are you being willfully stupid? The Greek word there is unintelligent or unenlightened. Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, are you still so unenlightened? Are you still so dull? You just don't get it. He goes on, he says this, he asks a question, he says, don't you see whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Literally, what goes into the mouth just it goes through you, it gets expelled into the latrine. The evil you are exposed to isn't the issue. It won't stick to your life, it's merely passing through. Unless, and we'll get to that in a second. Verse 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles a person. See, he's telling the people that whether you've washed your hands or not washed your hands, it's not your exposure to the outside world that is what defiles, what makes you sinful. The evil you are exposed to isn't the issue. The issue of defilement isn't what what touches you. The issue is what's already within you. That's what Jesus is saying. And it profoundly changes how we respond to God. It profoundly changes how we view traditions. It's not that I have done the tradition on the outside that makes me clean. It's what have I done with the issues of the heart? Jesus is telling the people. Another occasion, Jesus said this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What a credible diagnostic verse. You want to know, when I was a mechanic, we'd hook vehicles up to diagnostic machines. When I worked as a paramedic, we hooked people up to diagnostic machines. We measured, we looked at what came out to help us understand what was going on inside. Your mouth expresses what's going on in your heart. You want a diagnostic tool as to what's going on in your life, in your relationship with God? Sit beside yourself and listen to what you have said. Listen to your conversations. Listen to your interactions with people. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 18 to 20, Jesus says, out of the heart, it's out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, thefts, falsehoods, slander, and Mark adds more to this list. Turning to your traditions to keep you from touching the unclean does nothing to cleanse the expressions of your heart or my heart. Paul says this in the book of Romans. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, and that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. 
goes on a little further and says this, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now on a side, I'm going to come back to that thought just in a minute here. You might sit back as I say, you know what, it's not, the, it's not what touches your life, what you're exposed to, that's not what makes you unclean. And some of you might sit back here and say, hooray, pastor, you've just given me a lot of freedom. That means I don't have to care about what I'm exposed to. That means that it, it doesn't matter what I watch, what I put in front of my face. I mean, the porn I'm addicted to isn't an issue anymore because, pastor, you're saying it, it, it just goes, it, it's not an issue. It's on the outside. You may sit back and say, hooray, what touches my life isn't the issue, but you miss an important point then. Your choices, my choices, the choices we make are also an expression of our heart. James says it's not God that tempts us. Rather, we are tempted when something draws on what's inside of us, and that gives birth to sin. The choices I make as to what I want to be exposed to, what I want to touch my life, the choices I make. There's a difference between I have been touched by something that's sinful versus I am looking to be touched by something that is sinful. There is something, there's a difference between my exposure to something and my looking for an excuse to be exposed to something. My choices are also an expression of my heart. Out of the abundance of my heart come the choices that I will make. I don't want you to walk away from here with the foolish notion that your exposure to whatever is all on the outside. It can be. But when that exposure is the choice of the heart, rather than the byproduct of trying to live for Jesus in a sinful world, that choice exposes something in our hearts. Back to the main point. Your traditions will not save you. Your traditions will not bring change to the untransformed heart. Bible says, be holy as I am holy. You can touch not, be exposed to nothing sinful. You can be cloistered away from all evil influence, but you will still be there with you. And until your heart has been changed, until your heart has been transformed by the grace and power of Jesus Christ, no amount of hand washing or any other tradition can make you clean. For by grace we are saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. Our participations and traditions cannot make us clean because they will not deal with the issues of the heart. There's only one place our life can go to become clean. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the grace of God that comes to us through what Jesus did on the cross. It is the blood of Jesus that brings cleansing to our life. If you want to deal with what makes one clean or unclean before God, it's not about what you and I will be exposed to on the outside. But rather this, have you this morning received a new heart in Jesus? Have you come to Jesus? Are you letting the Holy Spirit transform your life with a new heart? that changes what comes out of your heart regardless of what you are exposed to. That is where holiness comes from. Traditions have their place. But the promise of God was this in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Their traditions, their laws, all of those things could not save them. It could not give them hope. It could not change their life. Only an encounter with Jesus. Maybe I'd summarize it this way. Your encounter with religion will do very little for you. It's your encounter with Jesus that will change your life. And I don't care if you've been going to church here since you were Marcus's age. I don't care if you follow through all the prescribed things that have been expected to you in your religious traditions. I don't care. What I care about is, have you had an encounter with a living God? Has Jesus 
transformed your heart? Is he continuing to transform your, your heart? The promise is that we are given a new heart and a new spirit that God will put within us. Jesus is not concerned with what's going into you as much as he's concerned with what's coming out of your heart. What are the expressions of your heart this morning? See, for some people, they go to church every Sunday. But once Monday comes, they're a different person. Because Sunday has just been a tradition. Traditions are good if they lead you to, into worship, if they lead you into intimacy with God. Traditions have their place. But the tradition will not transform you. When washing your hands leaves you unclean is when you look to your traditions to change your life. And when you use your traditions to hide your heart from God. What do the expressions of your heart say this morning about what's going on with you and Jesus? You might be a believer. You might have that new heart. You might have the Holy Spirit within. And as Christians, we're, I'm going to share a verse in a moment. And as Christians, we don't lose the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, when we become Christians, the Spirit of God comes within us. We don't lose the Holy Spirit, but we can quench Him. We can harden our hearts to His movements in our lives. We can replace the workings of the Spirit with dead traditions and live as though dead ourselves. What do the expressions of your heart this morning say about what's going on with you in Jesus these days? What issues of your heart might you be hiding behind lifeless traditions or daily rituals? Perhaps we need to come together in the word of the psalmist who said this, Lord created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. I can invite you to stand. As we sing that scripture this morning as we close our service off.
know, I actually thought at the beginning and even yesterday and this morning that this sermon was going to be more fun to preach. That's what it came across to me and I was preparing. But as I preached it, I realized that it isn't. It's a challenging word because it speaks to religious people and our ability to use tradition to hide ourselves from the Word and Spirit of God, to go through the motions with a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. And I'll confess that pastors know how to fake it probably more than anyone else. We know the words to say. We know how to pray the right thing in people's presence because we've done it sincerely and we still remember the words. And pastors, like everyone else, continually have to remind themselves, God, I want the joy of my salvation to be based in what the Spirit continues to do in my heart. I don't want to live just out of religious forms or religious traditions. I want to get past that. Hold to the value of those traditions for where they're meant to lead us. But to go past that, to let the Spirit do something deeper in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is coming out of your heart and life these days? And how does that speak to what Jesus would want to do within you? I challenge you with that. And some of you will go home and say, oh, that was a downer. But here's the thing, when we respond to the Spirit of God in obedience, we are restored to the joy of our salvation. That makes it not a downer. That makes it a blessing if we would embrace it. Lord God, I want to pray for us as your people today. I thank you for this church. I thank you for your spirit and the work that you do within, within us. I thank you for your love that has been shed for us so abundantly through the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, for your people here. I pray, Lord, in the places that we are struggling to replace your voice in our lives with traditions. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would push us beyond that to allow you access to our hearts. Lord, create in us clean hearts. Renew a right spirit within us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of his spirit go with you all.